the monuments and the battlefield have always been controversial. It ebbs and flows, of course, but this debate we're having now as a country about, you know, how do we remember the Confederacy? This is not a new debate, and it's not a particularly novel debate. Hi, and welcome to Conversations Beneath the Cupola, a Gettysburg College podcast. I'm Bob Giuliano, president of the college and your host. In our last episode, I talked with alumnus and former president and CEO of the NAACP, Bruce Gordon, about the work that remains before us in building a racially just society. In this episode, I am joined by two members of the Gettysburg College community, Professor of Africana Studies and History, Scott Hancock, and Christopher Gwynn, a 2006 graduate of the college. Together, we will try to unpack the Confederate monument controversy, particularly in the context of the Gettysburg battlefield. Scott's scholarly interests focus on the African-American experience from the mid-17th century leading up to the Civil War. Recently, he's been interviewed by various national news platforms, including CNN, Fox News, and on NPR member WITF's Smart Talk on the recent Confederate monument debate. Chris is Supervisory Park Ranger for Interpretation and Education at Gettysburg National Military Park, where he upholds the park's mission to protect, preserve, and interpret the Battle of Gettysburg and the Gettysburg Address for park visitors. Scott and Chris, thank you both for joining me today to engage in this timely and important discussion. So Chris and Scott, again, welcome. Over the last several months, there really has been an increasing amount of attention and urgency on important questions of racial justice. And one of the themes that has been raised is the question of the role of monuments in marking our history, and particularly as it relates to the Civil War. Obviously, these issues have special resonance to us here at Gettysburg, given the battlefield. So, Chris, let's start with you, if we can, and just briefly, can you walk us through the history of monuments on the battlefield, why they were put up in the first place, and particularly whether there is a history behind the Confederate monuments that people should be aware of? Yeah, sure. And again, thanks for having me here. I think it's a wonderful thing to be talking about. The first thing I would say is that the original monument is nothing made out of bronze or granite. The original monument is the battlefield, and that's an important note. So literally... Days, weeks, months after the battle, the residents of Gettysburg recognized that something significant had happened in their community, and they begin to preserve the battlefield. They create an organization called the Gettysburg Battlefield Memorial Association. And these individuals have as their, again, their primary goal, the creation of a monument to the Union victory and to the Union slain at Gettysburg. But their idea is that the battlefield is the monument. The ridges, the woods, the hills where the battle was fought, that's what's important. So they go out and they start to buy up land. And then this becomes really one of the country's first real preserved battlefield spaces. And what happens in the years following the Civil War is veterans, especially Union veterans, come back to the battlefield. They mark the battlefield. They create this kind of tourist culture that takes root in Gettysburg. And eventually, particularly in the 1880s and 1890s, Union regimental associations and Union veterans come back and they dedicate monuments to where they fought on July 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, 1863. They create monuments to honor their slain comrades. And I think a a point that's missed by a lot of people is that the battlefield is originally envisioned to be a Union memorial park. So this is not going to be a place necessarily where the idea of, you know, reconciliation takes the forefront. This is going to be a place where the Union cause and the Union victory are really celebrated. And what we see happening over time is a movement away from that as the federal government becomes involved in the management of the battlefield and as Union veterans organizations like the Grand Army of the Republic, as they start to kind of lose power and sway over the battlefield. But you know, the battlefield is, is, has been constantly evolving since 1863. It's never been a static place. And so it goes from this Union Memorial Park to a place where, again, we're going we're gonna to honor the courage and valor of both sides. But when we started to do that as a country, those bigger issues, race, slavery, the meaning of the war, they got pushed to the margins. And that was the case for a long, long time, really up until the 1990s and early 2000s at Gettysburg. So it's been an interesting evolution. That's a really helpful history, Chris. 
Scott, I know you've spent a lot of time thinking about the significance of the monuments, and particularly the Confederate monuments on the battlefield. And you've been speaking with CNN and other media outlets about this recently. Would you reflect on that for us and how you view the evolution that Chris just, just described of the battlefield? I think the Confederate state monuments speak in a very different way than many of the brigade and regimental markers. And like a really prime example of that is where the North Carolina State Monument is, because right across the road is the 11th Mississippi. And it's a statue of a, a standard bearer kind of waving the men forward over the hill, over the ridge. And and it's it's a dramatic statue, and all statues are going to dramatize the war and sanitize the war. And that is problematic in itself, but that's certainly not something that's unique to the Confederacy of the Union or the United States for that matter when it comes to monuments and memorials. But that monument on the base, on the plinth that has information about the officers, casualties, like a lot of the monuments do. So it's a very educational. It's probably not entirely inaccurate. Even the, the statue, the depiction is, is realistic. You could think of a standard bearer perhaps maybe did that during the battle. Yeah, I'm sure there's some imagination there as well. But, but the state monument right across the road has a big tablet that talks about that, you know, the, the, the fighting for valor and the cause it's a very dramatic statue. It's eye-catching. It was done by Guts and Borgelum, who did Mount Rushmore. And so for me, the state monuments and other historians, not just me, they speak in a different way because the context of when they were put up, whether you're talking about Virginia 1917, North Carolina 1929, Alabama 1933, or the rest of the Confederate state monuments, were all, which are all put up in the civil rights era and afterwards, the context of white supremacy, the context of putting up a monuments to a, a history when that history has fairly successfully rewritten the history of the Civil War to write African Americans, for the most part, out of the story, at least push them to the margins, and to tell a story that this war really wasn't about slavery. It's revisionist history. And all history is revisionist, but some revisions are bad and some are good because they're based on good research and evidence. And I would argue much of the history of surrounding those monuments is based on bad history. So, Scott, you're drawing a distinction, if I'm hearing you right, between the regimental monuments and the state monuments. And so if you had complete autonomy over the battlefield, what would you do with the state monuments then? Well, <laughs> if I had complete autonomy back in 1917 on, they would have never been put up in the first place. You know? but, but since they're there... And that's the reality we have to deal with. And since it's a, a difficult process to remove them. So what I've said before, if the only two options were for them to stay or be removed, I would be supporting removing the state monuments. But I don't think those are the only two options. And, and the reality is removing them is probably unlikely. It's probably going it, to, it takes literally an act of Congress. And I think politically, that just seems like it's unlikely to happen anytime soon. And even if it was, I'm not convinced it would be the best option because we could actually use those. And I think the National Parks are going to, their mission is to educate the public the best they can. I think that using the state monuments to educate the public about when they went up and why they went up and how they removed African-Americans of slavery from the heart of the story could actually tell visitors, the million or so visitors who come every year, something really important about how We've had these, this long history in America of trying to protect a narrative that ultimately protects whiteness and white supremacy. So, Chris, how do you see the monuments? And do you share Scott's sense of the distinction, historically at least, between the regimental and the state monuments? And how, as the person who helps the public interpret the monuments, do you see the state monuments? So there, there is a difference between the state monuments that Scott is talking about and the regimental monuments that, that make up the vast majority of monuments in the Gettysburg battlefield. The first thing I'd say is that there aren't many Confederate state memorials. There's actually only one that's placed by the veterans themselves. So it's just simply, there's not a lot of them at Gettysburg. The other thing you have a lot of in the park are what we call War Department tablets. And these are primarily informational markers that are placed by the United States government. And they tell the story of each unit in the battle in very kind of matter of fact language. So they'll talk about what a specific brigade did, when they arrived, where they attacked, how many casualties they suffered. And uh, these are written primarily 
by veterans of the battle, including Confederate veterans that the United States War Department brought in to help them manage the park in the 1890s and early 1900s. So most of the state monuments are created by state commissions, and the vast majority are placed long after veterans have ceased to play any role in the development of the park. And in terms of how we use them in the park interpretively, and here I'm speaking about the state memorials, you know, I find them to be really useful jumping off points for larger conversations, kind of like the one we're having right now. So I would take groups of school kids out to the Virginia Memorial, and you know, we talk about memory and history and the tension between the two. We talk about the development of the park and how that has kind of evolved over time. And, you know, a big thing that I drive home with visitors, and I use these Confederate monuments as examples of this, is this idea that the monuments in the battlefield have always been controversial. It ebbs and flows, of course, but this debate we're having now as a country about, you know, how do we remember the Confederacy? This is not a new debate, and it's not a particularly novel debate. If you go back to the early 1900s, Union veterans, the War Department, which again is managing the park at that time, and Confederate veterans, they're engaged in almost this exact same debate. So we can go to the Virginia Memorial and we can literally see kind of enshrined in the, in the granite and bronze some of these controversies. The flag on the Virginia Memorial, for example, is the Virginia state flag, not the Confederate battle flag, because in 1917 that was considered too inflammatory a symbol. And so they swapped out this anachronistic flag to go on the monument. We can talk about inscriptions and how they were battled over. So they're great tools to talk about, again, this tension between history and memory on the battlefield. So Chris, how do you, if you're, if you're not having a tour with the benefit of someone like your perspective, how does the typical visitor understand that this isn't a new debate, that this is, uh, these are enduring issues that speak a little to what Scott said a moment ago, which is the ever-present effort to write and rewrite history? Yeah. So th- that, that's the great challenge. That's the great challenge. And unless you have someone facilitating this, this conversation for you, or unless you have some means to engage with that layer of, of history, it's a very ephemeral thing. And all you see is the messages that that memorial by itself is conveying. You know, we really hope that when visitors come to the battlefield, they start off in the museum and they see the exhibitry that talk about the legacy of the war, the causation of the war, reconstruction, the development of the park. We hope that. But we know that for most visitors, they they don't get that experience. And so that's one of the great challenges that we as a National Park Service, and especially those of us that help manage battlefield parks, is how do we introduce that context on the battlefield in a site-specific way? How do we get visitors to think critically about those things out on the battlefield? How do we bring that museum experience to the battlefield park? So Scott, we have seen the question of monuments elsewhere generate a lot of heat and attention, whether it was Silent Sam that stood over the campus at the University of North Carolina for many years, or last week, I think, the Confederate soldier known as At Ready being taken down in Charlottesville, not far from the site of the events there of a couple of years ago. How do you think about those monuments in juxtaposition to what's at the at the battlefield? Yeah, that's it's probably a short answer. I'm all for those ones being removed. They're just a perfect example of monuments to an age of white supremacy that we're still dealing with. And, and they obscure a lot of history. So the, the easiest difference is they're not on federal land, right? So the process is really different about how you're going to deal with them. But the benefit of the ones being here on federal land is I I think when you have people like Chris and Steve Sims and other people in National Park Service who who understand history, and I'm sure there are probably some things that we would disagree on, but I think in general, there's pretty broad agreement that, you know, slavery was a central cause of the Civil War, that everything, some one way or another, directly or indirectly tracks back to slavery. And that's an important story to tell about why there was a battle at any battlefield site along with the military engagement and, and all the other important information. So on federal land, you know, the NPS can, can, they can shape that story and do the kinds of things that Chris is talking about or, you know, wrestle with how to do that. Whereas in, 
a town square or something like that. And people aren't going to those monuments usually for educational purposes. So that leads to a question. Just on July 4th weekend here, Chris, your park was the site of active protest and counter-protest with people coming to defend the monuments, at least by their description. How does the Park Service make sense of an event like that? What are you seeking to do when a situation of protest, counter-protest, in this case, some people were armed, help us understand how the Park Service engages on those events? Well, you know, the first thing I would tell you is that we're obligated to follow the law. And in the state of Pennsylvania, it's an open carry state. So if you're a citizen of Pennsylvania and you want to go to the battlefield and bring your, your weapon with you, as much as you might not like it, as much as I might not like it, that's something they're, they're legally allowed to do. It's a challenge, obviously, for our law enforcement staff. It's a challenge, I think, for our visitors who want to come here and explore the park to be confronted with that, but we follow the law. The second thing that the Park Service is obligated to do is make sure that parks are places where people can express their First Amendment rights. And throughout the history of the Park Service, the parks have always been used for that. The you know, March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in 1963, where Martin Luther King stands on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and gives the I Have a Dream speech, that is an, an example of a First Amendment activity happening in the National Park. So again, at Gettysburg, we're obligated to allow that and to, to the degree that we facilitate it with our permitting process, make sure that people have an opportunity to do that and to do it safely. The other thing we're obligated to do is to protect the safety and well-being of our visitors and staff. And you know, sometimes there are tensions between those three missions. And that's something the National Park Service has to navigate you know, very carefully. But on the other hand, I think Gettysburg has always been a place since 1863 where Americans have come to try to figure out, okay, what does it mean to be an American? Who gets to be a citizen? How are we going to deal with issues of race in this country? And so, again, I see what we had this year on July 4th as part of that history and part of that evolution, as challenging as it might be for the National Park Service to, to be able to manage that, and as varied as the opinions of, of folks might be on, on what that looks like and whether or not that's appropriate. Scott, going back to the conversation we had a moment ago about Silent Sam and At Ready, I have heard it argued that removing the monuments is a form of erasing history not celebrating it. And in fact, what one ought to do is to contextualize rather than to remove. What do you say to that argument? I don't want to be disrespectful of people who make that argument, but it's just wrong. It's a baseless argument because one, why I keep telling people, I want more history. I I don't want less history. I want more history. The problem with those monuments, and let's say we're talking about a place, a a public square, like the ones in, in Charlottesville or Silent Sam or whatever, And I don't know historians who are saying, yeah, let's just make the history disappear. Because the problem is those statues have actually been part of making history disappear, right? Because they hide the story of the Civil War, what the war was about, you know, who was at the center of that story. They isolate it to one group. It's an important group, you know, the white Confederate soldiers uh, and leaders. It's not that they should be out of the story, but it just obscure so much. And part of what it obscures is how that, that bad revision of history was done for specific reasons and particular purposes. One example is so the Confederate battle flag. It's not that it never disappeared, but when the Confederate battle flag really comes back into public culture in a big way is right after World War II. And it does that because it's white Southerners who, and not all white Southerners aren't monolithic, but those who did not like integration, who did not like the fact that the federal government was trying to dismantle legal Jim Crow, legalize white supremacy, they used that as a symbol to protest, to push back against the federal government. And it was all about race. You know, it wasn't about states' rights. It wasn't about individual rights. It was all about race. So the Confederate battle flag, when it was just finally taken off the state of Mississippi's flag, people want to say, well, taking that off of the flag hides history. They say, no, it actually gives us a great opportunity to tell a much fuller story. So, yeah, it's, it's not about erasing history for me. It's about a better, more complete, fuller history. So there's legislation pending in both the Pennsylvania State House and 
I think it's passed the House of Representatives federally. And Chris, I recognize that you have constraints on your ability to comment on that. But if legislation were passed that required the taking down of all Confederate monuments, and by all, I'm not distinguishing between the state monuments and the regimental monuments, but how would that affect your ability to help the public understand the history of the battle and the history of our country? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Bob. And, you know, I have a couple of thoughts on that. The first is that, you know, as you stated, the National Park Service doesn't comment on pending legislation, which what you mentioned is. But I think a lot of Americans are under the impression or the idea that somehow, you know, Gettysburg National Military Park has some sway over what stays and what goes. And that's not what we do. What the National Park Service does is we take care of the stuff that the American people tell us to take care of. And we interpret and educate the preserved spaces in the United States. And that's what our job is. So we're not in the monument making business and we're not in the monument taking down business. We let the American people through their elected representatives do that, which I think is you know, one of the wonderful things about the Park Service, because it means you have a very varied national park system where we protect and preserve everything from Grand Teton to Japanese internment camps that were set up in World War II. My job stays the same. I'm here to educate people on the American Civil War, the Battle of Gettysburg, its causes and its consequences. I'm here to do that irregardless of of how the battlefield evolves. And it will always evolve, and it's going to continue to evolve. But my core function doesn't change. Thanks, Chris. Scott, one of the points you've made is that the, and you've made it in, in different respects in this conversation as well, that even as the battlefield evolves and even with the monumentation that exists, we have a myopic or at least a narrow view of the war and its causes and its purposes. Can you say more about that and whether you see opportunities to do more than we're doing to provide that broader context that would help illuminate more fully our understanding of the past? Yeah, this is why I say I I want more history. And I I think the best example of what you're asking about is the South Carolina Monument. There are many examples. It's It's not the best, but it's a really good one. But it says on it, the inscriptions that they were fighting for the sacredness of states' rights. And so one of the things when different groups asked me to take them on these kind of informal tours of the battlefield, like the Confederate monuments or the Black history of the battlefield, I always like to go to that because behind it are the mountains to the west, right? South Mountain Range. And we know that some escaping slaves use that mountain range to uh, sometimes come into Gettysburg temporarily or go further north toward Carlisle, Harrisburg, other places. And South Carolina, if you read their Declaration of Secession, they're the first state to secede and politically and economically, along with Virginia. And so South Carolina, when they secede, their Declaration of Secession, after a long preamble, it identifies as the first reason, and really the primary reason they spend most of are talking about, is that the federal government isn't really doing anything about the problem of escaping slaves that Northern states had either ignored the Fugitive Slave Act or the Fugitive Slave Law of 1793. They were t- like Pennsylvania telling law enforcement officials in the 1830s not to help. They weren't allowed to help slave catchers. And so Southern states are really unhappy that the federal government isn't using its power to force Northern states to comply with federal law. And so what I argue to people, and some it might oversimplify a little bit, is essentially you have Southern states wanting the federal government to suppress Northern states' rights. So this whole thing about Southern uh, states seceded just for states' rights, which we always say, well, what's what's the primary state right they were looking to protect was to to own the right to own slaves. But they actually wanted, they liked the power of the federal government when it was protecting their interests, and they did not like it when they lost control of their government. So telling, and I think that's why I, I would say, let's not remove the South Carolina mind and let's use it to tell these kind of stories about how it you know, twisted history around for particular purposes in the mid 20th century. So, so this naturally leads me to you. I understand that you are, the Park Service is working on interpretive panels to help broaden the understanding of the monuments and their history. Can you say a word or two more about what you hope for that but also history is contested ground. How do you decide what you're going to reflect on those interpretive panels? Yeah, and you know, one of the things 
I'll say is that I'm in, I'm in complete agreement with Scott that we want more history, not less. We want to complicate the narrative. We want to add different layers of history. And there's not one way you do that. You pursue it in many different ways because people consume history in different ways. People find different jumping off points and people engage with the park differently. So the signage that you that you mentioned, that is something that we're working on. And it's part of a much larger comprehensive plan where we're redoing all the signage in the park. So all those interpretive panels that that you might see or Gettysburg College students might see as they, you know, run by the peace light, we're redoing all of them. And we're doing it to help visitors make sense of the battle, to follow the ebb and flow. But we're also doing it to highlight stories that previously haven't been told or haven't been told enough. And that includes the story of individuals like Abram Bryan, who's a free African-American citizen who lives in Gettysburg. We're talking about the role of immigrants in the Army of the Potomac. We're talking about the role of, of monumentation and memory reunion. So we're truly, really trying to, to um, have a very broad and inclusive approach to telling the story of the battle. And as part of that program, as part of that signage plan, are the ones we're going to put at some of these very significant pieces of, of statuary and monumentation in the park. So at the Virginia Memorial, at North Carolina, at South Carolina, as Scott just mentioned. And, you know, we're very fortunate that we have a lot of wonderful community members that are partners with us. We're fortunate to have the support of the Gettysburg Foundation and their Historians Council. And so this is not just a a me effort or a Gettysburg effort, but we're depending on the same experts that help us craft the museum experience back in 2008 to help us tell this story in a way that's engaging and in a way that's accessible. But it's, it's not just the signage. We're talking about digitizing some of our primary sources and putting them online so that students and and Civil War researchers across the world can delve into some of the primary source material behind the placement of these. So they can read the debates and controversies themselves as these memorials are taking shape. We're developing a, a very robust living history program that's not just going to be focused on military maneuvers, but that's going to be focused on the civilian story and the African American story on the battlefield, which I'm really excited about. And so it's, it's, it's not just one thing, it's many things. I'd even mention the rehabilitation of the James Warfield House, which is one of Gettysburg's black citizens. It's smack dab in the middle of the battlefield. And in two or three years, what we'd really like is for that, that site to be part of the official tour when you take a battlefield tour, but also to be a jumping off point to talk about all of these big issues, the experience of, of African-Americans during the Gettysburg campaign the role of slavery in bringing on the war, the you know, very complicated story of what happens after Appomattox during Reconstruction and you know, all the way into the 20th century. So there's a lot of different ways we try to convey those stories to visitors, not just one. That's very helpful. Scott, let's wrap this up with a question to you that draws on what Chris just said. The battlefield is currently configured has very little in the way of African-American voices or history told. What would you want it to do that reflects that aspect of the history that is, I think, largely untold? I think the museum is fantastic. The battlefield, Black voices, presence is absent with the exception of Abraham Bryan and the work that Chris and others have done more recently on the James Warfield House. So, you know, kind of going back to your earlier question, if it, you know, in my ideal world, if it was completely up to me, you'd have many statues or a former uh, high school student I coached in soccer. He was an architect. Now, his suggestion was black obelisks erupting from the ground of different sizes all along Confederate Avenue to signify the six to 10,000 enslaved laborers that the Confederate Army brought with them. And that's a really complicated story about those slave laborers or some kind of memorial or monument about the black man that pretty good evidence on Culp's Hill, a black man who either spied on or shot at Confederate soldiers, don't know who he was, good chance he was a local member of the Gettysburg black community. You know, there's a variety of ways, like I said, people more creative than myself could address that. And, I, and just in, you know, in case anybody's listening to this thing, oh, are you trying to cover up the military story? Say, absolutely not. I get that the reason people come to Gettysburg is because they want to know about the three days of the battle, for the most part. You know, that, that draws, I suspect, the majority of visitors. 
And so it's not about covering up those three days or the really tragic story of you know the 50 plus thousand men who were injured or killed here. That story has to be told, should be told. But there's a context around that. You know, why were they here in the first place? And if I, I could read a brief quote from this guy, so his name's uh, Michel Rothfriot. He's a Haitian historian, wrote a book called Slicing the Past. He wrote this year ago. He said, long before average citizens read the historians who set the standards of the day for colleagues and students, they access history through celebrations, site and museum visits, movies, national holidays, primary school books. I always keep that in mind that you know, the work that people like Chris do ultimately is going to reach far more people than any book that I'm probably ever going to write or article that I'm going to write. And, and I'm not saying that to butter him up. You know, they, I mean, most academic historians, if we write a history book, maybe a few thousand people write it, read it. We're talking about a million people a year who come through the Gettysburg battlefield. You know, so, and that's why I say, man, I, you know, we want to come alongside and assist and however we can to, to reaching people, because like Troy said, they're going to encounter history through that long before they read any books that us academics write. Well, that is a wonderful note to end this on. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Scott, for this really engaging and important conversation that speaks not just about the monuments, but the broader themes of how we understand ourselves and ultimately where we go as a country and as a people. So thank you for this conversation. Very much appreciated. Let me conclude with a slice of life from Gettysburg College. As we record this, the college is in the second day of a return to classes after the continuing effects and efficiency of the virus required us to move away from a fully residential campus. It's been a difficult transition and one no one wanted. I have heard it said that on any campus, the faculty is akin to a still but very deep pond a source of continuity and strength that lies at the core of any vibrant academic community. That's certainly true here at Gettysburg, and it has once again been on display as the faculty responds to the seeming inevitability of change with a singular focus on our students. Socrates is said to have observed that, quote, I cannot teach anybody anything, I can only make them think. With the changes the pandemic has imposed, of this I am confident, our faculty will continue to make our students think. Thanks for listening. If you've enjoyed this conversation and want to be notified of future episodes, please subscribe to Conversations Beneath the Cupola by visiting gettysburg.edu or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have a topic or suggestion for a future podcast, please email news at gettysburg.edu. Thank you, and until next time.